The Eerie Gauge War. Let's find out more about this historic skirmish. Tonight, on Project Algerine. In 1853, the railroad throughout the northeastern United States was controlled by many different smaller companies and wasn't as consolidated as it later became. Legal battles between the railroads and municipalities were common. But this battle was much different. It's December 27, 1853, and this train is steaming towards Erie from Buffalo, carrying 300 men armed with picks, axes, and shovels. They're expecting a fierce fight. Awaiting for them at their destination is a man named Moro Lowry, who is the leader of a group known as the Rippers. Moro Lowry and the Rippers may sound like a musical group playing at your local pub, but be assured this was no group of angels. Moro was not unknown to use brutal tactics from time to time to achieve his goals. But how did it come to this? How did things get so out of hand? To understand that, we need to start at the beginning. In 1849, John Tracy, who was the president of the Erie and Northeast Railroad, announced the construction of a new rail line from Erie that would extend eastwardly for 20 miles to the New York border. The tracks that the train would run on for this new Erie and Northeast Railroad would be six feet wide. Now, almost at the exact same time, a company named the Franklin Canal Company was laying track from Erie heading west to the Ohio border. The width of this track was 4 feet 10 inches. This meant that people traveling from Buffalo would be required to change trains at the New York border, and then again change trains once the train reached Erie. This became a huge inconvenience to travelers. Many times, the schedules of the trains conflicted, resulting in travelers being forced to spend the night in Erie. People immigrating west in those days had little or no money. Most were not prepared for such a delay, and found peanuts to be an inexpensive warm meal. The smell of fresh roasted peanuts filling the air, became a staple of downtown Erie which lasted over 150 years. This forced stop along the rail line, turned into big business for the hotels, theaters, and the street vendors of Erie. Many jobs and families became to rely on it. On November 16, 1853, the owners of the Buffalo and State Line Railroad announced that they had acquired two-thirds of the stock in the Erie and Northeast Railroad, and would be relaying the six-foot track with the now standard four-foot ten inches. The citizens of Erie suddenly became worried about losing their forced railroad stock. On November 26, 1853, the city council passed an ordinance allowing then-Mayor Alfred King to call out the police to remove any rail crossings over city streets. On December 7, 1853, the Erie and Northeast Railroad began changing its track, starting from the borough of Northeast and making its way towards Erie, bringing the track roughly 400 feet from the city limits. As the track inched closer to the city, the residents of Erie whom already had felt their livelihood threatened by the railroad, demanded the mayor take action. When finally the railroad was spotted delivering the material it required for changing the tracks in Erie, the mayor felt he was left with no other choice but to act. Early the next morning, a single cannon shot was fired. This was a signal to the residents of Erie to assemble in the town square. As the morning progressed, the crowd began to gather in the park. 
Mayor King arrives on horseback to a rowdy crowd. In a hastily made ceremony, deputizes Moro Lowry and another 150 citizens of Erie to become special police officers. After several hours of insightful speeches and whooping the crowd into a frenzy, Morrow and the Rippers make their way up State Street. Both bridges are deemed a nuisance by the city and the newly deputized men, who have now disguised themselves as women, begin to rip apart the tracks and bridge structures. This disguised tactic was so confusing to the railroad workers that they fled the city in terror as both their tracks and bridges burned. And that was just the beginning. Just east of the city, the borough of Harbor Creek, in a show of solidarity, voted unanimously to remove their tracks and began to do so immediately. The rippers of Harbor Creek tore up over a mile of track and burned down a bridge where it coincided with the road. This break in the rail line required passengers to disembark in Harbor Creek and then find their own means into Erie to catch the train again, leaving many people to freeze while walking the seven-mile gap in the tracks. On December 17, 1853, the railroad obtained an injunction from the United States Circuit Court in Pittsburgh. The injunction was to restrain the city of Erie, the citizens of Erie County, and all persons whatsoever, from interfering with the change of the track gauge. A United States Marshal was dispatched to Erie and located Morrow in the borough of Harbor Creek. When the marshal served the injunction to an often arrogant Morrow and pointed to the seal of the United States, Morrow responded by throwing the documents on the ground and stomping his heel, declaring the heel mark the seal of Harbor Creek. The Rippers kept the gap open, forcing the trains to terminate in Harbor Creek. This break in the line caught another person by surprise. On December 26, famous newspaper editor and publisher Horace Greeley happened to be traveling from New York to Chicago for a speaking engagement. Horace penned several negative editorials which were published in the New York Tribune about his experiences in Erie that night. His last one read, Erie should be avoided until the grass shall grow green in her streets, until her pie men in disrepair shall move away to some other city, not inhabited by fools and ruffians. The editorials escalated, an already tense situation. On the morning of December 27, 1853, a train loaded with 300 railroad men is leaving Buffalo and is headed towards Erie. Just east of Erie, the rippers of Harbor Creek were in the process of abating the nuisance of the railroad track. When the train was spotted at the last stop before the state line, Someone sympathetic to the cause noticed the men and wired ahead to Erie. In Erie, the cannon was shot off to alert the rippers of the approaching train and to call on the citizens for assistance. The train stopped just after the Harbor Creek station. Conductor Coglin approaches the men and a scuffle immediately ensues. Coglin points his gun at the rippers misfiring, and twice again before finally going off the third time, striking one of the farmers in the head, knocking him to the ground. It's at that point, in which all hell breaks loose. 300 men came pouring out of the railroad cars and began attacking the rippers. The group was clearly outnumbered. Just when it looked like it was going to be a slaughter. In the distance, there was a bright light approaching from the west. It was thousands of residents of Erie, rising up to help the Rippers. The railroad men fled back into New York, with a couple of stowaways still celebrating on their train. After the events that transpired last night in the borough of Harbor Creek, the federal marshal has again been dispatched to Erie. On January 11, 1854, the federal marshal arrested both Morrow Lowry and Mayor King. 
both would be brought to Pittsburgh the next day to stand charges of hindering the marshal who was attempting to arrest several other rippers. They were placed into the Allegheny County Jail. Back home in Erie, people were starting to take sides. One side for the rippers, the other, for the railroad. And one of those, who was for the rippers, was Pennsylvania's governor, William Bigley. Many people say Bigley intervened, and aided in the release of both Lowry and King from their jail in Pittsburgh. Back home in Erie, the rippers, were still tearing up the tracks as fast as the railroad could repair them. Support for both sides were beginning to rip the city apart. Many, either owned stock in the railroads, or worked directly for them in management or what were known as white-collar positions. Factory workers were not allowed to discuss the topic. But people hold grudges. One way the rivalry was able to be expressed was through the local sporting teams. The Rippers in the east, and the White Collars to the west. This began a separate east side versus west side mentality that lasts to this day. Several new bills were enacted, and a railroad gauge standard was put into law. People's attention were moving on to other things. Once the Secretary of War, Jefferson Davis, threatened to send federal troops in to protect the mail route, things quieted down. But the real end to the Erie Gage War was when the governor sent Andrew McClure. McClure got both sides to sit down over several bottles of rye. By morning, an agreement was made, and both sides shook hands. The agreement would bring the railroad to Erie's bayfront creating many new shipping jobs, and the rippers would leave their tracks alone. By February 1st the trains were running smoothly through Erie and the war was over. From time to time, a farmer would rip up the tracks in disputes with the railroad. But nothing like what took place back in the winter of 1853. You've been watching the Erie Gage War on Project Algerine.